When managing the severity of a traumatic brain injury, it's really important for us to know what line we need to step in and do something that is really a cost, uh, cost risk benefit analysis. When a patient has a head injury, I want to make clear that a head injury by itself, even if we suspect there's bleeding in the brain, does not warrant some of the extreme treatment that we may go through that's associated with impending herniation. So as the patient suffers their injury, some mild increases in intracranial pressure, as we saw in the mass effect, may not cause dramatic changes in signs and symptoms. In which case, if we try to do some of our extreme maneuvers, we may make their condition worse and further push them towards decline. In herniation, however, there's really not much left that we can do except for these extreme maneuvers because they're at a point in which the brain is extremely stressed. Blood flow has cost many neurons and may be causing anoxic brain injuries in which those neurons may never come back if the patient does survive. Signs of impending herniation include signs of increasing intracranial pressure. Those things will include Cushing's triad, again, an increased blood pressure, a decreasing heart rate, and irregular ventilations. Mass effect causing that shift in tissue will eventually start to try and exit out the foramen magnum, which gives rise to our impending herniation consideration. Clinical signs and symptoms of increased intracranial pressure can include, as mentioned, our Cushing's phenomenon or the Cushing's triad, bradycardia and hypotension, but we can also find in addition to ventilatory responses, patients may exhibit posturing. Notice we have decorticate and decerebrate posturing highlighted here. Where would you find some of this documented? It would be in your frequent GCS score as well. Note that in trauma, generally frequent GCS scores and a decline in GCS over a short period of time is indicative of increasing rates of mortality. Signs and symptoms of changes to pupils can vary. We can have changes in pupils that are bilateral if we have global injury to the brain. We can have changes in pupils that result in one being smaller than the other. And certainly the size and shape of the, of the pupil can change, not always being just circular and either dilated or constricted, but we can find oblong shapes of the pupil as well. In this list here, I've got a diagram that, or a table rather, that shows signs and symptoms of brain herniation and which area it's likely coming from. Now, this isn't to necessarily be strictly memorized, but it will help and tie to your knowledge of the underlying brain physiology, what the signs and symptoms we're seeing in our patients might indicate is going on in our brain. So changes in the patient's LOC are likely associated with at least the midbrain being impacted, and certainly as the brain is impacted in the brainstem, lower levels of pons and medulla, it had to get through, in most cases, the midbrain to get there. Personality changes may be associated with the frontal lobe, but can also happen in chronic encephalopathies. Ventilatory changes are a mix of the pons and medulla, specifically some of the centers in the pons, and the signs that we see with Biot's breathing, chain Stokes breathing, and those other irregular patterns. Pupillary changes are associated with the cranial nerves and can be associated with the midbrain. Decorticate posturing comes from midbrain. The cerebit posturing comes from midbrain and cerebellum now being impacted, which is worse than our decorticate posturing. And bradycardia likely coming from impacting the medullary's vital center, specifically for heart rate impacting the a cardiac center, when we see blood pressure changes, that can be an impact in the vasoactive center as well. Seizures can come from either focal areas or generalized seizure from generalized abnormal activity, the result of cerebral ischemia. Let's go back to our brainstem for a moment and highlight some of the roles that the brainstem plays in normal function and what will eventually become abnormal function in herniation. So again, we have our midbrain sitting up here. We mentioned RAS, pupillary changes. It's also responsible for coordination of eye movement. So our cranial nerves associated with eye movement should be assessed as well. In the pons, we have two major centers associated with breathing. The apneuistic center is essentially named appropriately, apnea. The apneuistic center in a normal functioning brain is responsible for the off switch, basically limiting the degree of stretch that we have when our chest expands during inhalation and stopping the inhalation phase, then allowing for our passive relaxation exhalation phase. 
The pneumotaxic center is a little different. It's involved more in coordination of our ventilatory rate and to some degree, the length of our exhalation phase. The medulla oblongata is our primary involuntary control center for our respiratory coordination. But again, if the medulla fails, we do have a mechanism in the pons that can serve as a backup involuntary respiratory control center. It doesn't do as good of a job and might result in some of those irregular ventilatory patterns that we've talked about. Let's talk about Cushing's phenomenon to a little bit more degree. In Cushing's phenomenon, generally we have not just a lower heart rate, but bradycardia, where maybe in trauma we might expect that their heart rate would be elevated if they were in shock. Blood pressures can commonly go sky high, 200, 300 plus on the patient's systolic value. And irregular respirations can range from ataxic, meaning there's very little coordination, it's just kind of all over the place and chaotic, or very organized central neurogenic hyperventilation, or chain stokes breathing, which has that typical pattern of starting off with very shallow breathing, getting starting very slow, going faster and faster with deeper breathing, getting a crescendo and going downward back towards a point of slow, shallow breathing, a period of apnea, and the process starts over again. All of these are signs of impending herniation. So why does the blood pressure go high when the heart rate goes low? Well, we've described why blood pressure might change if we're dealing with a flow issue, which is likely to happen in our increased intracranial pressure. Now, some of the things that are on the next two slides are pretty straightforward and probably easy to deduce from your understanding of what we've covered so far. Let me mention the Babinski reflex is a reflex that is mentioned in your book. There's a picture of the reflex as well, I think checking it with, with some device. Um, but realize that the Babinski reflex should be absent in adults. And if it's present, unfortunately, it's an indication of brain injury. In the clinical progression of herniation, once we get past some of those compressions of the structures we've already talked about, the autoregulation that occurs inside the patient's brain, normally managing blood flow with cerebral perfusion changes, is going to contribute to the further demise. So as the body realizes that the brain doesn't have adequate blood flow, it's going to increase our mean arterial pressure and cerebral perfusion pressure by increasing systemic blood pressure with activation of the autonomic nervous system. That's going to involve changes in blood vessel and uh, uh, heart strength of contraction. Well, as this is occurring, assuming that we just have a brain injury here, otherwise it gets a little bit more complex, if the patient only has a brain injury, as this is occurring, baroreceptors in the carotid body and the aorta are sensing that for the rest of the body, this blood pressure is way too high. So the body is now facing this idea that it doesn't necessarily systemically see a reason for the blood pressure to be so high. The brain is going without cerebral blood flow, so it feels like his blood pressure isn't high enough and continues to jack it up. As a result, one of the things that will happen is the uh, 10th cranial nerve or the vagus nerve will be stimulated. That will send a signal to the heart rate to counter the elevating blood pressure. That will result in our heart rate going down and give rise to that unusual bradycardia. Initially, this may have been the result of a cascade of the primary brain injury, but as we have changes in ICP and we have changes in cerebral perfusion pressure, ischemia from both primary and now secondary brain injuries because of a lack of adequate uh, oxygenation to cells is going to continue swelling and feed into itself until the damage is permanent. When managing patients with herniation, we do have some specific things that we want to work on. Number one, it's not extreme at all and is extremely important before we get to some of these more aggressive measures. But limit secondary injury and break the cycle of injury to help manage traumatic brain injuries is one of the goals of managing ischemic herniation. Now, make sure that you, again, know the difference between the shock triad and the Cushing's triad for very similar vital signs and that the two of these, if present in one patient because of multi-systems trauma, might mask one another.